All right, get your Bible out today and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Many people know Matthew chapter 5. In fact, many of your liberal churches, they go to Matthew chapter 5, and that's the basic doctrine of their whole church. That's about all they ever talk about or preach about. And it's just so sad that they don't rightly divide it. There's nothing wrong with going to the Beatitudes, but they should be rightly divided. And a lot of people don't know how to rightly divide, so they just go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get most of their doctrine from it. That's before the cross most of the time, because Jesus dies way late in a lot of those books. So are we going back to before the cross to get our doctrine? So we've got to remember that what we're reading here in the book of Matthew, we're seeing Jesus' earthly ministry. So this is where we're seeing what we're reading here is Jesus' earthly ministry. So as we're studying this, it's all happening right here in that three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. All right? Before the cross. Now, in Matthew chapter 27, I believe, is where Jesus finally dies. That's what starts the New Testament, the death of a testator. So we need to remember what we're doing. Remember that we are looking back to see the nation of Israel and what they're doing as their Messiah comes. And as we look back, we see the nation of Israel rejecting their Messiah and his kingdom. So it is postponed. And that's what we call the postponement theory or the postponement fact, if you will. <laughs> because they rejected their Messiah, that last week of Daniel, prophesied in Daniel, has to still be future. And we read that in Romans 11. We understand that, that because they rejected their Messiah, well, God says, okay, well, I'll go to the Gentiles. So I like the way that Ray says it, and this is the best way I think to say it, is that Daniel's prophecy, I feel like I'm writing smaller and smaller, but Daniel's prophecy is on hold right now until God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel in those seven years. So this is the time of grace and the church where we're saved by faith in the blood. And it's not the law. And it's just a wonderful time to live because now is the easiest time in history to get saved. And I believe that teaching dispensations is the most important thing because it helps you to understand the Bible. And so many people I've seen get saved over the years or learn my ministry and, and we're already saved, but we're studying with this. And they all tell me the same thing. This is their testimony. Thank you for teaching dispensations. It opened the Bible up to me, made me want to read it even more because now I can finally understand it. And yet I'd go and talk to other pastors and they'd say, don't teach dispensations. That confuses people. And I'm like, here's the people saying it took away their confusion. So I don't understand how a man could be a pastor and not teach dispensations because that's what finally shows us how to rightly divide. And what a great time it is. And we should show people, aren't you glad we're not under the law? Where some of you in here probably would have been stoned by now yeah. <laughs> by some of the things we did in our life that was stupid. I mean, aren't you glad we're over here? This is the best time to live if you think about it. So we see it postponed. So God is going back to dealing with Israel after the rapture. That's why there must be a rapture. I was talking to a, a guy, I believe he's from Canada, on the phone last night. And he was saying, are you sure there's a pre-trib rapture? Are you sure? And, and I just said, yeah, let me show you. And he goes, man, that makes sense. He says, why would God save his church just to go beat them up <laughs> and let the Dan Christ beat them up? He goes, yeah, it makes sense that God would get us out. Yeah. There's a reason that the church is leaving at the rapture. Now, I've got a lot to get into today, so I've got to hurry because this is a little bit of a long chapter. I want to get through as much of it as we can. I think we can get through the whole thing if I don't get off subject like I do sometimes. But I've got to show you this, okay? Jesus' doctrine is the kingdom message. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So from chapter 5 all the way up to chapter 8 and verse 1 is all Jesus' message teaching them about the kingdom. All right? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28 and 29. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So he's teaching from chapter 5, 6, and then 7. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Many churches you go to today, the pastor doesn't have an authority, does it? 
we can hold up this book and say, that's our authority. It's the King James Bible. It's great to have an authority. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So what is happening here in the context? What are we seeing taking place? Well, chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now back up and look at chapter 3 and verse 2. This is John the Baptist, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's, can we turn that fan down one notch? It's blowing my papers all over here real quick. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing Jesus teaching his kingdom message. So what we see in chapter 5, 6, and 7, I like to call this the constitution of the millennial kingdom. So, and I'll abbreviate. So what he's telling them, part of it is here. He's telling them, this is what you're going to go through here. But also, when I come back as king and I set up my throne and I'm on the earth, this is how it's going to be. So do you see how you got to rightly divide? A lot of people try to take the Beatitudes and put them here. <laughs> and that's kind of hard to do because that leaves out this and this and this. He came for this. This should have been here if they'd accepted him. So this is the doctrine that Jesus is telling them right here. So when we get into this, we're looking at this and we're finding out that the majority of what Jesus is saying here is all about this time. Now we can apply some things to us today, but it's very hard. So before we get started, we need to see how do you rightly divide? How do you apply scripture? When we go to the Bible, we read the Bible and we need to say, okay, doctrinally, who is he talking to? And what is the doctrine from this verse? Is it for us or is it a different dispensation? Is it literal? Most of the Bible is literal. We try to take it as literal as possible unless there's something that's figurative. But you take as much as you can literal. Now you can take some of the Bible and make it devotional or spiritual. So as we go through this book of Matthew chapter 5, doctrinally, literally, it's Jesus telling the Jews, this is what it's going to be like in my kingdom and when you go through the tribulation. So, but does that mean we, ha we don't take any of it for us? No, we can take some devotional things out of it to us. Figurative, well, no, but historical, yes, and contextual. Always check the context. And as we go through verse by verse, and that's what's so great about teaching verse by verse, you see the context. You can't deny that this is applying more to this over here. But we can also try to devotionally or spiritually apply some to us, but it's hard. It's hard to do that in some cases, and I'll show you this later to show you what I mean. So as we get into this chapter, I'm excited about this because we'll be talking about the kingdom of message. And uh, Daniel's prophecy is on hold, and we know why. John the Baptist came, sent by the Father, they rejected his message, the Pharisees. Strike one, they rejected the Father. They rejected the Son. Crucify him, they yelled. And who was it that told them to yell, crucify him? The religious leaders. And then way out in the book of Acts, around about chapter 7, here comes Stephen. And he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised, why do you always resist the Holy Ghost? They rejected the Holy Spirit. So three strikes and you're out. So there's your postponement. There we see we're in the greatest time to live, the church age, where the Apostle Paul is the one who is called the Apostle to the Gentiles. So a lot of that doctrine of Paul is for us today. So, when I was in Bible school, this is what the teacher said, and I wrote this note here. Where a verse doesn't cross a Pauline epistle, you can apply it doctrinally to the church age. So, do you understand why Paul is so important? He's the apostle to the Gentiles. That's us. Gentiles aren't Jews. They're different. And so, God gave him a lot of revelation for this time for us. And so, we read him, and then we go back and read Matthew and see, now, where does it match and where doesn't it match? And there are some things that Jesus said that we can apply to us because they don't contradict what he told him later. But there are some things that are clearly not for us because they're not grace. All right, so with all that stated, let's start in chapter 5 and verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came into him. All right, some people call this the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what mountain was that? I don't know. I looked in the others, Mark, Luke, and John. It doesn't say. It just says a mountain. But if you know Jesus' habits of where he went all the time, 
he would always, it seemed like, go to the top to the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Now, I haven't been to Israel, but if the Lord tarries, and I hope he doesn't, somebody wants to take me there toward the end of this year. And if he does, I'm going to stay for probably a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, because I just want to record as much of that as I can and put it online so people can see it and actually see it firsthand. But in the old days, here's Jerusalem, and there's a valley you go down. I think it's, it's the, the Kidron Valley. And you go, and there's a little creek down there, and you come up over here on this side, and there was a mountain called the Mount of Olives. And they say that the Mount of Olives, you could look straight down that valley and see the temple. And a lot of times, Jesus would go up onto the Mount of Olives. So my thought is maybe he's there on the Mount of Olives teaching this, and every now and then he looks over there, because he's looking where he's going to sit someday. <laughs> because he knows he's the king of Israel, and he knows someday I'm going to sit down over there. And he, he was probably sitting here looking over there while he's teaching them. Because he knew this is where I'm going to rule from in the throne of David in Jerusalem. He would have had a perfect view of where the old city of David was if that was the mountain. So the Bible doesn't say it, and so I'm kind of inserting that, but I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that that's probably the mountain it's talking about. Because he goes up there a lot if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that would be a perfect place for the king to give a speech while he's looking at where his kingdom and his city would be that he rules from. So Jesus is up there on the mountain. And uh, so I suspect the Mount of Olives, which, by the way, when he comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, then he eventually steps foot on the Mount of Olives. So he's standing on the place where he wins the battle and then comes down and comes into Jerusalem. Isn't that an interesting thing? So it only took 2,000 years in between. But that's because they rejected. How many is that in Jubilees? 40 Jubilees. They rejected God back when they left Egypt, 40 years. God says, you reject me this time, 40 Jubilees, 2,000 years. Isn't that crazy? So, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now, what we're going to get here is what they call today the Beatitudes, which I've never understood where that comes from. I see the word attitude in there, and it kind of has to do with your attitude, some of these things. But I, I was counting it, and I'm looking at it, and I thought, wow, how interesting. There's nine of them. Is there another nine that you can think of that Paul talks about? The nine fruits of the Spirit, or fruit of the Spirit. You know, sometimes they use it in plural or singular. Either way is right, because it's more than one. So nine fruits of the Spirit, nine Beatitudes. These are back here. Those are over there. So can we apply these to us? Well, certainly there's some things here that we can devotionally or spiritually apply to us. We need to act like this and have this attitude. But these look like they are literally to the Jews saying, over here when you go through this and when you're over here in my kingdom, this is how I want you to act. So that's the whole context of what we're reading here. So remember, he's speaking to Jews. So it says in verse 3, here's the first one, Blessed are the poor. <laughs> well, amen. We're all blessed, aren't we? <laughs> amen. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. What a weird thing to say. Wouldn't you want to be rich in the spirit? With all spiritual blessings, Paul says, and, and we have the riches of Christ. What is this blessed are the poor in spirit? Over here, Paul says, no, you're rich in the spirit because we have the Holy Spirit in us, right? And, and we have spiritual blessings and, and riches in Christ. So, what a weird thing. How come this doesn't seem to line up with Paul? Well, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. Well, there we go again. Do you remember the difference between the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the spiritual kingdom, so that's this one here. The kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom when Jesus is literally on the earth reigning. So, again, kingdom of heaven. Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so you got to remember, he's talking to these people, the Jews, about this over here. So that's the doctrinal, literal um, thing that he's saying. Now, we're going to try to take some of this devotionally to us, but I'm not poor in the spirit. I've got the Holy Spirit in me and I'm filled with it every day. So it's hard to apply that to us, isn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So. What an eerie, weird thing to say. And what does the Bible say when we get saved in Ephesians 1.13? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Is there a time when people are, are not sealed with the Holy Spirit? Well, I mean, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So it sounds like over the tribulation, somebody might not get it until they endure to the end. And then they get into the kingdom. Do you see that? Now, maybe the Jews get the Spirit during that time. But it doesn't say in the Bible that any Gentile gets the Holy Spirit in the tribulation. That's an interesting thing to think about. 
So it looks like this is more towards the tribulation. And there's a lot of verses we could go into, but we've got so much to get into, we'll move on. But have you ever thought about that? When you're reading the Bible, think for a minute. It says, blessed is the poor in spirit, because theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. So whoever's poor in the spirit is going to be rich over here in the millennium. So could it be he's talking when the Jews go through here? And why would they be poor, I wonder? Well, if you take the mark of the beast, then you can buy and sell. If you don't, you can't buy and sell. So you'd be so there's a lot there's a lot in these verses. When we go through them, we need to actually read them and think about what it says. Um, a lot more we can get into with that, and, and we will as we continue. But that's the first one. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, obviously, that's someone getting into the kingdom of heaven or getting into the millennium. That'd have to be the Jews that go through the tribulation. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn. What do they have to mourn? Is that to us? So we should go around every day going, I just want to be unhappy and cry so I can be blessed. <laughs> so please, Lord, put me through more things so I can mourn more so I can be blessed. Do you see how that sounds kind of odd for us? Paul says rejoice, and then I say rejoice. That doesn't sound like Paul. So blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. When do they get that comfort? Who's going to be mourning? Well, if you know your Bible, according to the Bible, the tribulation is seven years divided into three and a half and three and a half. We have the man of sin and then the son of perdition. And in the middle there, according to the book of Revelation, which we studied, he's assassinated. When he appears to come back from the dead, he goes into Jerusalem and he sits down on the ark or the mercy seat. It's amazing that it's called the mercy seat. And they claim that the ark, remember in the Bible, it had wings to the front and wings to the back, those two cherubims. But it was open here, and it would be a perfect place to sit down, and you could put your back up against those wings. And so the, the Antichrist is going to sit in that seat. And when he does, you know what that's called? That's called the abomination of desolation. Now those Jews are going to see that and going to do what? They're going to mourn. Because they're going to have their temple rebuilt. I believe that they are going to rebuild their temple and worship in it. We saw that in the book of Revelation. And then they're going to be kicked out for the last three and a half Years And we'll just have to go read that. So go with me to Matthew chapter 24. A lot of the book of Matthew is clearly to Jews about what's coming up for them. And so many people just say, no, all Matthew is for us. And they, and they don't rightly divide. That's a shame. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Is that for us Christians? Am I supposed to buy a ticket to Israel now? Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child of them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And it continues on and on. But who is this speaking to? Clearly the Jews in this time. And that abomination of desolation is in the middle. And now the Antichrist owns the temple. And the Jews are like, oh, we better flee because he's going to come after them and try to do what to them? <coughs> Kill them. The Antichrist is going to be very anti-Semitic and he's going to hate the Jews. So go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Oh, by the way, did you hear in the news about Netanyahu? Yeah. Netanyahu had some sort of sickness and they say they need to fix his heart and they're going to put a pacemaker in, in Netanyahu. And I immediately thought of the verse back in Isaiah where God says they're their heart. He's going to give them a new heart <laughs> to the Jews. I just thought, wow, isn't that something? Um, but uh, wow, what an interesting thing. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. So somebody in heaven is rejoicing. What are they doing down here? Mourning. 
and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. That would be Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of, great, of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness unto, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Three and a half years. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away. And it continues there. So what is this taking place? What are we seeing? We're seeing the Jews go through the tribulation. We leave it the rapture. They get their temple for three and a half years to worship in. And then the Antichrist comes in, kicks them out, and sits on the throne and says, I am God, like it says in 2 Thessalonians 2. And so for these last three and a half years, or 1,260 days, they have to flee into the wilderness. So they're going to be mourning, aren't they? What do you think they'll be mourning? The fact that they lost their temple again. You know how many times in history they've lost their temple? God gave Israel so many chances, and they always seem to turn against them. And so how many, I think I have a good video on YouTube about the seven tabernacles or the seven temples because they've rebuilt their temple several times and they're ready to do it again. So here we go. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. But do you see that? Blessed are they that mourn. If this is the context of the Jews, that would be the time in the future when they mourn, when they are so happy to get their temple back and then they lose it again. They're going to be mourning and mourning and mourning. But when will they be comforted? when the Lord comes back and rules over them. So this is the context. This is what it's saying. Now, verse um, 5, Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Wow. So who wants to inherit the earth? And what does that even mean, inherit the earth? Well, inheriting the earth sounds like the millennial kingdom. So if these Jews are humble and, and accept their Messiah and trust in Jesus because, oh no, we messed up. And the two witnesses tell them, hey, it really was Jesus. They'll have to humble themselves before God and say, yeah, we were wrong. And they'll be meek. But then when Jesus comes back, he'll let them into his kingdom to rule over them. Now, could we make a devotional application of that to the church? Well, sure. We're meek. We're humble. And guess what? We're going to inherit the earth as part of our inheritance, but we'll be in our glorified body. They're going to be in their natural body. So do you see how you can sometimes make a double application there? But literally, doctrinally, this is to Jews, and uh, they are, are meek during that time. So I looked up the word meek in the 1828 dictionary. Mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked, humble. So they have to be humble. So a spiritual application of this would be salvation, right? You get saved today and be blessed and live in the millennium in our glorified body. We could apply that to us. We'll go to Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. So yes, there are some spiritual applications or devotional applications that we can make from the book of Matthew to the church. For example, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. I love these verses that Jesus said. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. By the way, did you see my sermon this week? Resting versus resting. And don't rest the scriptures to your own destruction. Rest in the finished work of Christ. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. I should have used this verse in that sermon, and I didn't. <laughs> take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So Jesus says he is meek. So surely we can make that spiritual application from this verse in Matthew 5 and say, hey, we need to humble ourselves and come to God as a sinner and trust his blood for salvation. But also, it's clear that the context is he talking to Jews then, so they need to humble themselves so that then they can come before him and have them as their king. Okay? Do you see how you can sometimes make a double application? But don't, don't, uh, don't make an application where there's not one. Okay? Rightly divide. Make sure you rightly divide. Matthew chapter 5. Now verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, this does not say, blessed are those that are hungry and thirsty. Otherwise, we're all blessed right now, right? Are you thinking about the food here a little bit? Uh, it's, it's not saying you're blessed if you're hungry or thirsty. It says if you're hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Now, what does it mean to hunger after righteousness? It says, for they shall be filled. Well, are we righteous? I heard this story, I can't remember who told it, uh, of a guy who said that he was in a church. And the pastor said in the church, Whoever here is righteous, stand up. He said he and his wife were the only ones standing up in a huge church and everybody else is sitting down. And everybody looked at them and like, oh, 
hypocrite, self-righteous. And the pastor looked at him and goes, you're the only one standing? Everybody here should be standing up. Well, how come just you guys? And the whole church went, oh, and they all stood up real quick. <laughs> so the pastor goes, in Christ, we have his imputed righteousness. If you're saved, you should be standing up. He said, are you guys not saved? And everybody's in church is like, don't you hate it when pastors do that to you? And you don't know. You're like, uh, uh, I don't, uh, tell me, I don't know. You know? Um, but in Christ, we are already righteous. So how do we apply this to us? It must be someone over here who wants to be righteous. So that when Jesus comes, they, they, they get into the kingdom through, through following him. So interesting, isn't it? And now what happens? Uh, verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When shall they be filled? Twice in the Bible we have the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, it's Jesus feeding them because they didn't have any food. Well, over here, God protects the Jews and feeds them in the wilderness, just like he did way back here with Moses. Remember, they didn't have any food, and he sent quail, and he sent manna. So clearly, we're seeing a tribulation passage here. And it's interesting that it talks about hunger and thirst. Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 13, and you already know this passage, so I won't turn there, but in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 18, no man can buy or sell save he that had the mark. So... Hunger and thirst, that's interesting. They're going to be hungry and thirsty here because they won't take the mark of the beast. And I think that the Lord will protect them in the wilderness. Uh, turn over with me real quick to Revelation chapter 7 too. And let's look at this because this hunger and thirst thing. You see how it's hard to apply this to the church when Jesus is literally sitting there talking to Jews about his kingdom? This applies more to the tribulation. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 verse 16 and 17. There's some people in verse 15 that are before the throne of God. Who are they? Verse 14. These are they which came out of great tribulation. So these are people, probably some Gentiles, maybe some Jews, that didn't take the mark of the beast and they were beheaded for Jesus. So died as martyrs for Jesus. Look at verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So there's a lot of hunger and thirst in this time period, isn't there? And so how interesting that we see him hungering and thirsting. We think about hunger and thirst, but the actual passage says hunger and thirst after righteousness. So more than wanting food, they want God. You know what that reminds me of? Boy, I'm getting goosebumps. The Lord always gives me some nuggets. Here's a nugget. The book of Job. He said, I esteem thy words more than my necessary food. The book of Job has 42 chapters. <laughs> 42 is three and a half years. Just a coincidence. The greatest type of a Jew in the tribulation is Job. So, yeah, amen. So we're reading here through Matthew chapter 5, looking at the Beatitudes. Most churches just try to apply that to the church. It applies more to this time over here. Why are they missing that? Why aren't they rightly dividing? I don't understand. By the way, did you know that uh, they announced that there's going to be world hunger real soon? You know, they're, they're uh, telling farmers they can't have nitrogen to farm. Well, that's, that's your fertilizer. And they're, they're trying to make this fake meat. And but it's been in the news where they said, we're going to have a great shortage of food real quick in the next couple of years. Everything's coming to pass, just like the Bible says. Let me turn, too, though, to this companion passage, if you would, to um, Luke chapter 6. It's amazing that we're seeing everything come to pass, just like the Bible says. I really believe Jesus is coming soon at the rapture. It's all falling in place. Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. Here is your companion passage to the Beatitudes in Matthew. So Luke chapter 6 and verse 20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did your fathers unto the prophets. What does that sound like? Well, we try to spiritually apply that to us, to the church. Well, we've suffered for many years, you know. But literally, that's the Jews being reproached, being separated. That sounds like them going through this right here. Is that what you see? That's what I see. So persecution comes with it too. Nobody's ever persecuted a Jew, have they? 
Yeah, they have all throughout history. And they're still to this day, um, they're persecuting the Jew and they're persecuting the church. Why does the world hate us when all we do is try to tell them we love you and want to see you go to heaven? It's because the devil's behind the persecution. And we know that. So Matthew chapter 5, back to Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And it says, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So blessed are the merciful. Now, we can spiritually apply that to us today and say, hey, we ought to have mercy. <laughs> I, I watched TV as a kid, unfortunately. And they had that show, Full House, remember? Yeah. And what was the guy always saying? Have mercy or something like that. Uh, yeah, we should be merciful. We should definitely be merciful people. But is this literally to us or is this again to the Jews? When would be a time when the Jews need to have mercy? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. If you know the history of the Jews, the Jews loved to fight. Joshua was a great warrior. Um, all throughout the Old Testament, we see wonderful, wonderful people fighting that were Jews. And, and we have these stories all throughout the Old Testament of all their escapades and all their conquests and all the amazing things. And man, Jews are amazing. I, I love people that are, that are Jewish, okay? We don't hate Jews here. We are not anti-Semitic. And one of my favorite Hollywood movies, sometimes they get a good movie that's not bad, is called Cast a Giant Shadow. If you've never seen that, oh, it'll give you goosebumps. It's all about how this American general who was a Jew went to Israel and fought for them and they got back their land and how he did that and helped them. Uh, there was another one called Exodus, which was pretty good, too, about how the Jews came back to their land. And that's amazing because, you know, a lot of it, it, Hollywood is Jews, so they definitely wanted to remember that. But you see the Jews going back to their land, and you see God's hand all over helping them in battles. Have you ever heard of the Six-Day War in 1967? The war was over after six days because on the seventh day they needed to rest. <laughs> that can't be coincidence, right? So you see God's hand, and you read about the Maccabeans, Whenever the Romans came into Israel and, and took it over, they, they fought for hundreds of years, the Maccabeans, to try to get them out. So the Jews have a tradition of fighting. They have some of the best weapons in the world. If we ever get to go to Israel, someone said we might get to meet a guy who's going to go let, it, let us shoot some Israeli weapons. Shoot their Negev uh, machine gun and things like that. That would be awesome. So the Jews are people that want to fight. But guess what? God says, don't fight here. God said, I've already prophesied what's going to happen here. And you're not going to win against this fella. He's got his time. I'm going to be the one that fights for you and wins. So the last thing you want to do as a Jew in the tribulation is go fight the Antichrist because you won't win. But you need to wait on the Lord because he will. Now, where did I say to go? Let's go to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. When does this take place? Armageddon. And let's read more about it. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. And I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and we gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, this is Jesus, shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. So if you're left behind, you better be a friend to the Jew. Just in case you can endure through the end of that without the mark of the beast, God will slap you on the back and say, Good job, you took care of my people. I think it's good to take care of Jews today, right? Yeah. We pray for them, certainly, and we try to help them. Now, go to, um, let's see. I guess let's go to Luke chapter 6 again. We were just over in Luke chapter 6, but I didn't read the rest of it. Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and 36. Now, should the Jews fight? That's where I'm going with all this. Should the Jews go fight the Antichrist? They're not supposed to. And Jesus is telling them, look, when that day comes, you just trust me. 
because I'll come back and fight for you. So Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Okay, now let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, and we can plainly see how this lines up with the rest of Jesus' teachings to the Jews. Yeah, we can spiritually apply that to the church and say we need to be merciful. But it's literally telling the Jews, have mercy and don't go fight and be together, live together and take care of one another and love one another. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Now, see how that all works? Now, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, what does it mean, the pure of heart? What our pure of heart mean? Well, I was thinking about this and I started looking up pure in heart. Where else does that show up in the Bible? And it took me to Psalms chapter 24. And again, when you go back to a passage, always look at the context because the context of Psalms 24 is here, here, and here. <laughs> and you see that clearly. So Psalms chapter 24, look at verse 5. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the Lord of his salvation. Who is this? Verse 4, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. So Jesus is speaking and he's quoting sometimes from things he'd already said when he told it to David to write down. So Jesus knew his Bible. I think Jesus wrote the Bible. I think it was the spirit of Jesus inside David that wrote this down. So that when we read it in Matthew, we can go, oh yeah, he said it back over there too. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But just for fun, let's go ahead and read all of Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? Jesus. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. All right. Who shall ascend? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the Lord of his salvation. Now, we're saved today. We have salvation. But there's a physical salvation for these people. They're saved from the Antichrist when Jesus comes back. So do you see that difference? This is the generation of them that seek him and that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. So all these Jews are suffering for three and a half years, thinking it's the end of the world, no one cares about us, we're living out here starving in the desert. Ha! Ah, here comes their salvation if they'll just be meek and patient and merciful. Because here he comes, the King. And that's the context of this. And when is he coming? Verse 8, who is the King of glory? That's the Jews. They're like, who is he? Who's the Messiah? Well, now they're going to know it's Jesus. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. And who would His hosts be? Well, the Bible says He comes with His holy angels, but also we know He comes back with us because we go out here and come back with Him, and we all come back at that battle of Armageddon. So Matthew chapter 5, are you getting goosebumps yet? I am, man. Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So the pure in heart must be those Jews who of all their heart are seeking the Messiah and wanting Him to come and can't wait for Him to come back. Now the Bible talks about love out of a pure heart in 1 Peter 1.22. It also talks about charity from a pure heart in 1 Timothy uh, one five. So certainly we can spiritually apply this to us and say we should all have mercy and, and try to have a pure heart. But the context is clearly them too. So a pure heart means they're truly searching and looking for their Messiah and are trying to please Him and wait for Him. And I believe it will be very clear to them that Jesus is the Messiah because there'll be those 144,000 and there'll be those two witnesses. And if they actually read the Bible, they'll see it. This is an interesting fact. To this day, most Jewish synagogues will not read Isaiah 53. Isn't that odd? If you read Isaiah 53, you can't help but tell that Jesus is the one it's talking about. He died for our sins in our place. So I'm sure they'll be sitting out in the desert during those last three and a half years. 
you know, and they'll say, well, let's read the Bible. Well, they said we couldn't read that. Let's go ahead and read it anyway. <gasps> That's Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So there's going to be a lot of enlightenment for them and they're going to see some things. So that's the pure in heart thing. They shall see God. When shall they see God? Psalm says, lift up your heads. So they're out there and they'll look up and they'll see him coming back at the battle of Armageddon. Won't that be amazing? So I see Matthew clearly more to Jews. Okay. You all see that as well. Now, Matthew chapter five and verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What is a peacemaker? Well, clearly that's somebody that makes peace. But the Antichrist comes making peace. <laughs> so what is it saying? Don't fight. Uh, a lot of times our first instinct is to fight. But like I said, you don't fight the Antichrist. You wait upon the Lord. So you just say, okay, peace. Matthew 26, 51. Matthew 26, 51 through 52. Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Remember this story? This is probably Peter that cut off the ear. So Peter said, I'm going to use force. I don't want peace. They're coming out here to do bad stuff to us. We're going to attack them. What did Jesus say? Good job, Peter. No. Verse 52, then said Jesus to him, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So it sounds like you don't pick up a sword and go fight the Antichrist. <laughs> because this is all prophesied that he's going to do this. But how many Christians today go around and say, there's no rapture. There's no rapture. We got to fight the Antichrist. <laughs> you're going to perish and you're not going to endure to the end, are you? Because the Bible says he wins for a short time. And it's all prophesied that he gets that full time so that he can come back and defeat him. So the last thing we as Christians would ever want to do is fight the Antichrist. We, we want peace, don't we? So applying that to the church, we, we're peacemakers. We, we don't want war. But Israel needs to realize they cannot win in their own strength. They have to trust the Lord who will come back and fight for them. Okay? Boy, I went a long way to say all that, but I hope you get what I'm, what I'm saying. So back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. Um, well, should we go to Luke real quick? Yeah, we should. Just one more verse. Luke 21, 24. Luke 21, 24. And as you're reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see this theme over and over again. Jesus speaking to Jews about that time, the tribulation. And it just all becomes clear when you rightly divide. Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword... And shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, the times of the Gentiles ends with the tribulation. So do you see how you don't go pick up a sword and go fight? That's what he's saying to them. They need to flee. You know, there's the old fight or flee. Well, flee and put your faith in the Lord. Matthew chapter 5. All right, Matthew chapter 5. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So who's been persecuted more than anybody? Probably the Jews for the last 2,000 years. And so they'll probably be persecuted again, for sure. And um, they'll definitely go through even more persecution. I was going to take you to Matthew 5, but we're going to get there eventually. And Jesus says, blessed are you, you know, when you're persecuted. Um, Matthew 10, 23 Matthew 23, 34, and Luke 21, 12. All those talk about them going through the persecution and everything like that. So now look at verse 11 here. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. <laughs> Have you ever gone through something like that when people say things against you that's false? Mm -hmm. Never, right? Mm -hmm. Have we ever seen that, I don't know, in politics where there's certain people that you know care about the country and and people talk bad and, and say things falsely about, I mean, like maybe bring lawsuits against them falsely and impeach them falsely. And they, I mean, no, we never, no, it's weird that the things that are going to happen here, we're starting to see like a preview before, <laughs> isn't it? It's almost like if you're wholesome and righteous and good and want to do right, you're the bad guy. But if you're out there doing evil things, then you're the good guy in their eyes. Well, one of them that call good evil and evil good. You heard about this show, this movie about the trafficking of children and how all these people that claim to be Christians are all, yes, we want to defend the children. 
And yet all these bad people are saying, well, no, there's no human trafficking. There's no child. And it's just like the lines are being drawn and we're seeing the people take their sides. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. So back to Matthew chapter 5. We've got a lot to get into. It says... Verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So there's an application to the church that we can make, that when we are persecuted, that means we get rewards in heaven. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. (laughs) I don't pray for persecution, but I do know when I'm persecuted, I get more rewards in heaven. Now, how does that apply to the Jews if the Jews are getting into the millennial kingdom? I don't know, maybe they'll get into the kingdom and then when they die, they'll have some rewards up there too. So do you see how it kind of goes back and forth? It kind of sounds like part of it's to the church, part of it's to to us. See how you can try to make some uh, applications to the church in this. Verse 13, For ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. So who is the salt? Well, this is literally speaking to the Jews. They are the salt of the earth. But also we can make a spiritual application and say we're salt too. Now what is salt for? Salt is for seasoning, is what we think of. But in the old days, salt was for preservation, to preserve something. They didn't have refrigerators in the old days, so they'd take like ham and salt the whole thing so much that it tasted horrible, but it would preserve it. So salt is for preserving The earth is preserved by the fact that we're here as Christians teaching the gospel. Otherwise, it would have gone to hell in a handbasket many years ago. And how about the Jews? Are they still around? People debate, well, there's false Jews. Yeah, there are false Jews. I don't know who the real ones are or the false ones are, but I do believe that God still has His Jews. And so there's a preservation that took place from the time of Abraham all the way to today. And so salt has to do with preservation. How neat. God will never, ever give up on the Jews because he's ruling in Jerusalem for a thousand years. So there must be some true Jews out there. All right. So there's your salt. See how you can make a double application. But yet we that are saved, we can't be cast out. Right. So it's hard to make an application to the church there because when we're saved, we're in the body of Christ. So two things here that God says to the Jews that they're like salt and then verse 14, light. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, what is the light? Well, if we spiritually apply this to the church, I think of the gospel. And the Bible talks about the light of the gospel in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. So we're supposed to shine that light to the world of the gospel of how to be saved. That's New Testament. That's over here. So that's the gospel. What would the light of the Jews be? Any idea? Well, God gave the scriptures of the Old Testament to the Jews. And he gave them the law. When that law came out, if you study history, it wasn't just to Israel. That law went all over the world. And all these nations, the pagan nations all over the world, looked at the Ten Commandments and looked at the law and said, that ain't bad. (laughs) And they adopted it and they took a lot of it. Remember Hammurabi's Code? Uh, Part of that looks like it kind of lines up with the Scripture. So that Old Testament, that law was a light to the world back then. And now we still have the New Testament, which was given us by who? Jews. And that's the light of the world. So it's amazing as you go through and look at this. So you're the light of the world. And then it says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. What would be that city? Jerusalem. So see, there's people in churches that go through Matthew and they say it's only to the church. A lot of this is not to the church. It's talking about a city set on a hill. Well, that, and so Jesus is teaching to Israel about here's what's coming up. Okay, but yes, there are some things that we can glean for us. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So here's your little candlestick thing. And and I just think of it like this. I don't remember how much a bushel is, but it's a lot. And you put a whole bunch of stuff in a bushel and and usually you have a basket. Well, if you light a little fire and you put a big old basket on top, it's going to put it out. (laughs) So he's saying, let your light shine, basically. And that's what he says in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let your light shine. Well, to us, that's Christians. We say let our light shine, the light of the gospel. But what what would a light be for the Jews? Well, John tells us that Jesus is that light. So Jews, when you do accept your Messiah, let him shine. 
Show the world that you believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah and let him shine. So hopefully you're getting the idea here that as you read through Matthew, you have to rightly divide and you can see how it's applying more to the Jews in the future. Now, verse 17, a controversial statement for some people to this day. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus fulfills the law. And the law was all about him. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, we see Jesus talking. And it says that he expounded unto them all the law and the prophets pertaining to him. So all that Old Testament, the law and the prophets, is all about Jesus. John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ, and it points to him. So Jesus says he came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill Now, some people go to this verse and say, so we're still under the law. Are we under the law? The law and the prophets, what was it say? We're we're into John, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So what does Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 say? And why would Jesus say this? Because Jesus hadn't died yet on the cross. And after he died and then they rejected him the final time, then everything changed. But if you go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, the Bible is very clear that we are not under the Old Testament law for salvation. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What part of you are not under the law do people not understand? But people today still say, nope, nope, we're still under the law. Okay, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Were they justified by faith under the law? (laughs) Doesn't sound like it. Different dispensation. But after that faith has come, so it must not have been over there, it's over here, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So we're no longer under the law. Okay? Um, Let's go to Romans 10, 4. There's a lot more verses that we could go to and get into, but... Just because Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it, doesn't mean we're still under it. He fulfilled it. Now we're under grace. But we still have the Old Testament law to read, but we don't keep it thinking that's going to get us to heaven. Jesus is the one that gets us to heaven. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When you read Romans chapter 7 verse 1 through 4, it talks about how we're dead to the law. So that law has no dominion over us. That law cannot keep us. We come through Christ and we're saved through Christ, not through the law. I was going to read Galatians 5, 13 through 18, but it says we are now under grace, not under the law. When you talk like this, people say, well, then breaker, you think we can go do whatever we want and break the law? No, the Bible says use not grace as an occasion for the flesh. We have the New Testament. We have Paul. We have the New Testament. And a lot of things that it said there, Paul says over here. So I don't follow it because the law says it. I follow it because the New Testament tells me how to live. And now that I have the Holy Spirit in me, it's easier to live for the Lord. And that's what it says in Galatians that that we are no longer under the law. We're follow the Spirit. So read Galatians 3, 13 through 18 if you get a chance. We've got to get back to Matthew chapter 5 and finish this up. So chapter 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Now what is a jot? It's like a yo, a Hebrew letter, the smallest little letter. And a tittle um, would be like maybe one of the little things for the vowel points underneath. Do we still have the Old Testament law? It still exists. You've got it in your Bible. So it's still here. Are we under it though? No, but we still have it. So he came to fulfill it and we still have it. We can read it because what is the law? It's the mind of God. It's what God says. This is what I want you to do. This is what I don't want you to do. This is what I like. This is what I think is an abomination. So there's nothing wrong with reading it, but don't think you get to heaven by keeping it. Now you're saying, look at me, God, and accept what I do. When Jesus says, no, look at me and accept what I did. So do you see the difference? So, Matthew chapter 5, verse, uh, what do we get to? Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, this is to Jews over here. 
That's not to us. We're not keeping the commandments to get to heaven or to get into the millennial kingdom. Verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, out there. So this is a person getting into there based upon their own righteousness. We get to heaven based upon the righteousness of Christ. These are some people. So that begs the question, do the Jews get back under the law over here? It appears so. The Jews don't accept the New Testament. So when they rebuild their temple, they go back to the Old Testament law, thinking that that's what they're still under. That's why they do sacrifice for three and a half years. And then they're going to get a, a rude awakening. Uh, guys, you should have you chosen this blood, not the blood of animals. So I believe the Jews try to get back under that Old Testament law. So Jesus is talking to them here about their righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ that we receive. Verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, when on earth is this? Is this today? You're a fool. Oh, I'm going to hell. No, I'm under grace. All my sins are forgiven. I'm sorry. I was, I was just using that as an illustration. You're not a fool, but you know what I'm saying? Jesus said one time, Thou fool. Paul said, Thou fool. So Jesus is going to hell? Paul's going to hell for saying fool? You see how he's given them the rules of this is what I want it to be like under my kingdom. Nobody goes around calling people names because they just might be in danger of going to hell. <laughs> so this is what I call the constitution of the millennial kingdom. This is Jesus starting to say, now this is what it's going to be like. You don't kill. You don't do these things. By the way, in verse 22, do you see those words without a cause? Those are taken out of new versions of the Bible. So new versions of the Bible say, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment. Do you know Jesus looked about on them with anger, it says? So Jesus is in danger of going to hell? Yeah, if you believe the new versions of the Bible. But if you have a King James, no, he had a cause. What was the cause? Righteous indignation. He was angry with them. So, so important to have the King James Bible and every word of God. Because you take that out, you mess it up. So much more we could get into there, but be careful of new versions of the Bible. So we'll get through this real quickly. We've got a lot more verses. Basically, I've just set it up to where we'll just read the rest of it. Look at verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Is that for us today? Do we go before an altar? Do we bring sacrifice? He's clearly speaking to Jews, and that's probably going to happen over here. But do we do that in the church today? Do we go down and leave a little offering down on the altar? A lot of churches, they say, this is the altar of the church down here. And there's nothing wrong with going down there and praying, but this is clearly to Jews in that time, okay, is what I'm trying to say. Now, we've got to finish this up. So where were we? Verse 25. Now look at this. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. What is this? Is he saying the Romans cast you into prison? It sounds like what Jesus is saying is when I'm king, you're going to all love each other, and you're all going to do right, or I'm going to put you in jail. Do you see how that sounds like the millennial kingdom, the rules? And that's what it sounds like. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So Jesus is saying, here's the thing here. Um, you know, it's not just the fact that you actually do the deed. If in your mind you're thinking about it, he's going to hold you accountable. Now, we can spiritually apply this today, and we should. There are a lot of people doing this, committing this horrible, heinous sin. Verse 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee and for one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Did you see that? So Jesus is starting to give the rules of what it's going to be like when he's in his millennial kingdom. And there are certain things that if you do, he's going to pitch you straight into hell. Do not pass go, do not collect 200, straight into hell. 
And they say that over there, the lowest spot on earth is the Dead Sea. And that it's just like one earthquake away from just falling down. And some people theorize that there will be hell, like, a, like burning there. And that literally they'll take people and throw it in there. And so maybe that's what happens. But Jesus is pretty harsh in his ruling as king. He has a zero, what do you call it, zero tolerance policy, if you will. And he's saying if you're into pornography and stuff like that, then you need to just reach in and pluck your eye out. That's the context. Now, verse 30, we have another verse that makes no sense in context, except in the tribulation. So let's look at what it says, verse 30. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now the context here is a sexual sin. So does this have to do with you doing something sexually with your right hand? If so, well... Do we need to start bringing to our churches machetes? Is this for the church today? I mean, every church in America needs a machete. And everybody that has problems with pornography and stuff like that needs to come to church and punk, cut it off. That does not sound like grace to me, does it you? But that's the context. But also, look at the verse 2 by itself. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. Okay? Context is here and here. What is it that could be given in the right hand that might offend somebody later? The mark of the beast is taken in the right hand or the forehead. So could Jesus be saying in this verse that if you are a Jew and you take the mark of the beast and then you realize later, ah, so you chop it off? I don't know. I theorize that's a possibility. I don't teach that doctrinally as for sure. But it is interesting that you look at the rest of the verse. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, if you know your Bible, you know one thing. You know that um, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, those that have the mark of the beast will be cast into hell. That's in Revelation 14, verses, um, let's see, I got it here, 9 through 11. So is this a verse that's saying that, if a Jew takes the mark of the beast, that that's the only way that they could get into the millennial kingdom? It was if they do that. I mean, here he comes back and they're like, that's the uh, chop, chop, chop. Hi, Jesus. You know, <laughs> maybe because the context is being pitched into hell. So they're like, you know, hi, Jesus. <laughs> could you imagine living in the millennial kingdom? Everyone would know what you did. And who you, oh, you're that guy that didn't love Jesus very much. What, shut up, I love him now. Look what I did for him. So I don't teach that too terribly dogmatically, but at the same time, the context is someone being pitched into hell for not doing that. So it's, it could be a possibility. But um, that's definitely not for us today. Otherwise, there'd be churches all over America and the world that the pastor would have one of these at the pulpit and somebody come forward, Pastor, I have a problem with pornography. Okay, put it out. Chunk. All right, now you won't have that problem anymore, will you? I mean, do you? So you got you to gotta rightly divide. Otherwise, we're all chopping each other's hands off. Amen. Now he gets into divorce. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So Jesus gets into Divorce and starts talking about it. Now, does God want a divorce? No. There's another passage where he says to the Pharisees, Moses, for the hardness of your heart, gave you the writing of divorcement. So it's hardness of heart that a person gets divorced. Now, there's a lot we could get into on divorce. I won't get too much into it. But turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And I have a book here that I wrote about what the Bible says, okay? Not what Robert Breaker says. What the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You can read this for free on my old website, rrb3.com. You can go to our new website, thecloudchurch.org, and look under uh, bookstore and buy this if you want. I don't make hardly anything on it. But this is the verses, because the Bible has a lot to say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And over there in Malachi, it says God hates putting away. Now, Mark chapter 10 Verse 5 through 12, we read, 
Oh, well, this is the verse, verse 4. And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. And Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. For from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. For then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God does not want people to get divorced. Okay? Now you say, well, I'm divorced. Well, get the book and see what the Bible says. There's lots of things more. There's, I guess you could call them little loopholes, if you will. Like if an unbeliever and a, and a believer are married, if his wife leaves and she's not saved, the Bible says a man's not under bondage in such cases. If the unbelieving depart, let him depart, or vice versa. So there's lots of little things, but the absolute best thing is never get divorced. That's God saying that's what he wants. Now, maybe you already are. What do you do? Well, thank God the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. Amen? But we're supposed to teach our children that marriage is for life. And divorce destroys families and really society and even generations. They say that once there's a divorce in a family, usually those kids get divorced and their kids get divorced. And so divorce is not good. It's not something that God wants. And uh, so, what's that? Yes, when you're married, you say, till death do us part. And that's what the vow is, so that's what you're supposed to be doing. Is, is, so, you know, till death do us part. So the man sleeps with a gun under his pillow and the woman with a knife under her pillow when they sleep at night. No, 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 that's not how that works. No, I'm just joking. It's a joke. But that's the way God set it up. Now, if your wife dies, you can remarry. Or if your husband dies, you can remarry. But I don't have time to get into the marriage, divorce, and remarriage. This has a lot of information that goes through and shows you all those passages. And one of the main questions people have is, should a man who's been married more than once be a pastor? And I'm not going to go there because I don't have time. But if he was one time married to an unbeliever and she departed, well, he's not under bondage. So if he remarries, he's got one wife and he could be a pastor. But if a man divorces his wife after he's saved, no, no, he shouldn't be a pastor. I think that's horrible. And I've seen that, and it's so sad to see pastors divorce their wives, and then other people say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And so we're supposed to be leading by example. Amen? So if you marry someone and you're sorry you did, well, stick with it for the rest of your life. Amen? Blessed are they that mourn. Amen? Um, no, no. Um, but anyway, but always remember, teach your children marriage is for life. Okay? Now, we've got to finish this up. So Matthew chapter 5 and verse... 33, again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not swear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communications be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now this has to do with taking an oath. What a weird thing. Well, you know why I think that has to do with that? When the Antichrist comes, he's going to make everybody take a mark. And the Bible says, and they will worship him. So he's literally going to say, you have to swear to me that you are making me your God and that you'll obey me. Could a Christian do that? No. But could a person in the tribulation do that? No. Not if they believe that Jesus is the true God, which is their Messiah. So it's interesting. Throughout history, you, you don't have a lot of people making oaths to other people. But then in World War II, Adolf Hitler comes up. And Adolf Hitler told all of his soldiers they had to make a personal oath to him, not just to Germany, that they would serve the Fuhrer. Then this guy in Ukraine pops up named Zelensky, and he tells his soldiers they have to make an oath to him. Isn't that weird? So I believe that when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to tell the world, look, you want me to fix your problems, you take my mark, you worship me, and you make an oath to me that you do whatever I say. And so I think that's what this passage is talking about. Hey, Jews, don't, don't make... Now, we can spiritually apply that to the church, too. Let's don't make an oath to anybody but Jesus. Amen? That's different than making an oath to a flag. This is making an oath to a person. That's weird, isn't it? All right, we're almost done here. At 38. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I send to you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So Jesus is telling Jews how they're supposed to live in the millennial kingdom and how he wants them to be. And I guess you could apply that to the tribulation as well. Help those in the tribulation that didn't take the mark of the beast. We that are saved, we call each other brethren, don't we? You know, the Jews call each other brethren. Well, brethren are supposed to help the brethren. Verse 43, Have ye heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now we can apply this to the church too. We should totally be like that. We should love those that, that hate us. Uh, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. No time to get into the rain, but if you remember the book of James, and you remember Elijah, how they stopped the rain. It, uh, the Bible talks about the former and latter rain from time to time. And almost always in the context of the former and latter rain, it's always applying to during the time of the tribulation. Isn't that interesting? For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Now this is not republicans. <laughs> this is publicans. So I looked up, what's a publican? A collector of taxes or public revenues. So your IRS agents, if you will, uh, we're supposed to love them. <laughs> anyway, but um, anyway, do you understand, though, that, that it's in Jesus' day there were a bunch of publicans? Who was writing the book of Matthew? A guy that was a tax collector. <laughs> so he's probably writing this. I remember Jesus said that, so love me too, because he worked for the IRS of his day, if you will. But isn't that kind of funny that... Um, even I mean, of all the people he could have said, he could have said lawyers or car salesmen or something. But he says the tax collector because nobody liked the tax collector at that time. Verse 47. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. And then verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, how do we be perfect? In God's eyes, we are perfect it, because we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now, in man's eyes, we're not because we're sinners. But so how do we be perfect if we're already saved and have Christ's imputed righteousness? It must be talking about over here, you need to be perfect. You need to follow that law and not take the mark of the beast. And that's when God looks at them as, okay, I'll receive them when I come at the kingdom. So this is Matthew chapter 5. It sounds very Jewish. It sounds like a lot of tribulation and millennial stuff. And it's all talking about here. So why on earth would you preach that more to the church today? Why wouldn't you preach it in context? Why wouldn't you come over to Paul and tell people how to get saved? Do you see the message of how to get saved here? Does this tell you trust the atonement of Christ for salvation? No, it says here, let's go chop your hand off. <laughs> That's not the message of grace. It sounds like you want salvation. Be meek and wait to inherit and let Jesus bring the salvation to you. Physical salvation, not spiritual salvation of your soul. So it's very important that we understand that Matthew is God speaking to the Jews about the millennial kingdom and it's more applying to them. And when you rightly divide, you see that. But sure, we got a couple things in there for us too, didn't we? We should be merciful. We should be um, doing right and being nice to others and not doing bad things.